episode of SciCam, the science magazine show. I'm Michael Contario, and today we've also got John London and Deborah Durbin. And John is going to be talking to us about rockets, and more specifically, uh, the rocket car that he's got there. Hello, John. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you live and loud and clear, John. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, it's a little bit cramped in here because we're doing a test next uh, this this uh, in two days' time on Friday. So uh, we're we're packed away in the support vehicle at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a little guided tour of what in the future I might be driving. Hopefully, we'll be driving. So if you have any questions. Please do shout them out. But here she is. This is the laughing gas rocket car. If we get it up to uh, its full potential, we believe that it will be the first car to be able to go 400 miles an hour on a road. Every single car that's been able to go at this kind of velocity previously has done so sort of out in the middle of a, out in the middle of a desert, desert somewhere normally in America. Um, we're going to try and do it in the UK. It's, uh, it's an interesting hybrid uh, of various diff different sort of technologies. So starting at the front, we've got um, the boring bits as far as I'm concerned, which are the wheels and the chassis, because that's all standard, that's all sort of standard high-speed drag car uh, work. In fact, the original chassis of the vehicle was, uh, did, did several years as a, uh, a high-speed drag racer. It's down here at the back where, if you know anything about drag racing or anything about cars, that it gets a little bit more bizarre. Because where you would normally expect an internal combustion engine to be, we have these, uh, these four tubes, which are attached in turn to all this gubbins. It may look very, very complicated, but it's actually really, really simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, in the next five minutes or so, explain how this works. Now, the way a hybrid rocket engine works... is very very simple you've got a, uh, a free floating piston in a tank if you can see where that says free floating piston that is one of those tanks right there and you've got nitrous oxide at the bottom and you've got nitrogen at the top and that then comes down through a pipe into a kerosene wick fuel grain I can show you what the inside of one of those looks like later when I'm outside in the second segment. But basically, it's a cardboard tube soaked in kerosene that sits inside there. And then when we dump the nitrous oxide through the manifold system and into it, it uh, gets very, very hot and lots of gas comes out of the other end. F equals MA. We go forwards. Each one of these tubes produces in the region of 300 kilograms of thrust which is uh, not bad. It's about what we need to. Uh, as a total, uh, we estimate roughly with Dragon things, uh, because she's a relatively lightweight vehicle, that she's going to be producing somewhere in the region of 3 to 4 Gs. Would you like to see the, uh, would you like to see the cockpit? Yeah, take us, take us inside, John. Okay. We call it a cockpit just because, e even though it is a driving seat, it's far more like an aeroplane than it is like a car. Oh, don't you just love this World War II Biggles fairing? This is new. This has just come on now. We have never run with this before because it was starting to get a, a little bit windy uh, with the speeds we're getting up to. So we've now got this uh, wonderful riveted uh, World War II fighter canopy that's, that's, that's sort, of, sort of been invented to go on here. Okay. I don't know if you can actually see inside here. That's probably getting quite dark. Can you see what's going on there? A, li a little bit, yes. A little bit. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and get the light and bring it round just so that you can see what's happening here. Yeah. Okay? Yep, that, that's the best of you there now. Good, good. Hold on. I'm going to grab the light. You can see. There you go. As you can see, we have... A flashing light for some reason that's flashing. Okay, that's not working. We have various different controls here. The main thing that you might think of is a steering wheel. And 
here it is. It's not actually attached to the car at the moment. Uh, that's because it clips on just about here. It's such a tight fit that you can't actually get into the car with the uh, with the steering wheel attached. So that comes afterwards. Standard five point racing harness, uh, which is fairly bog standard, and the stuff over here. On your right foot, you're going to have the pedal, which basically is your dead man switch. So what that does is it, it uh, throws these solenoids over here, which then makes the entire car live, so that if something happens, you can just raise your foot and everything will turn off and everything will stop. This is your manual's turn on. So that will turn the car on. And then over here, this is your go button, basically, because that will throw the igniters. And as soon as you do that, uh, para, um, pyrotechnic devices will go off inside the tubes down at the other end. You can actually, if you look, see the, um, the spark plugs that go and attach to, uh, to the other end. Uh, obviously, they are uh, disconnected at the moment because uh, for safety reasons. Then, this is my favourite control right here. That's the main throttles. And if I operate the main throttle here, Oh, I can't at the moment because it's not powered up. Uh, what that does is that physically moves all these four manifolds here straight across on this giant shaft so that everything is mechanically controlled. We don't go for any kind of electric control where we don't have to because it's just something else to go wrong. So there's a physical wire connecting the two. Um, do you have any questions about how the car works? Uh, just um, a little bit. How much thrust did you say each of the, the, the those giant tanks at the back would actually be giving you? Uh, about three hundred kilograms each. So, uh, considering the car weighs about half a ton, about five hundred kilograms, um, she's going to go at a feral clip. Oh, brilliant! I want to know who gets to drive this. Uh, hi. Amazing. Aren't you worried you're going to crash? A little bit, yeah. My, my wife has uh, told me in no uncertain terms that she wants to at least be pregnant by the time that I first drive it. <laughs> uh, I haven't yet. I'm, I'm the new driver for this year. Uh, the, the driver used to be the person that uh, uh, designed the car. Unfortunately, uh, uh, she's 60 now, and so she's decided that her rocket car days are over and has moved over to me. I was originally uh, one of the rocket, uh, sort of, I, I really hate the term rocket scientist, but I was one of the engineers and scientists working on the, on, the, on, the, on the rocket side of things, and my main job used to be fueling the car, which is a, uh, a massive multi-step process, because if you do anything wrong, um, kablooey, you know, you, you will not do rocketry today, I think is my catchphrase for that one. Um, to give you an idea of uh, just how safety conscious we are, nitrous oxide is safer the cooler it's kept. So over here at the side of the support truck, can you see the large sort of the large container over there in the corner with, with the handles on the side? That's actually a large industrial freezer that we keep our nitrous oxide in so that it's absolutely freezing cold before it goes into the car. Uh, just to make sure that everything is as it possibly can be. Any other questions? Who's uh, funding this? <laughs> A variety of different sources. However, thank you very, very much. I can now say without nepotism, oh, thank you very, very much to our most recent sponsor, which is the fantastic Bill. And if you ever need any kind of casters, they're the people to go to. You might be wondering, why on earth does a rocket car need casters? I mean, we've, we've got big wheels that we drive on. And the obvious answer is, of course, getting it in and out of places is very, very difficult. You can't actually do it with the turning circle it's got. I mean, if I was to actually show you Hold on, I've got to put the camera down so you can show it. See this? Okay, what, 
what, just to talk us through what you're doing while you're doing it, John. Okay, sorry. I'm coming across an engineering problem that I'll just show an answer to. Um, the, the, uh, that's about full left, and full up to the right is not much further. The turning circle is probably somewhere in the region of about 20 to 30 metres. You know, it's, it's designed to go fast and straight, and so uh, that's why Bill and they provided us with a plastic set of casters so that we could actually get where we're going. Uh, all, all very interesting, and um, later on you'll be telling us about a little bit more about the physics behind the rocket engines in general. Absolutely, it's quite difficult to see what's going on here uh, because it's all sort of very, very tightly packed away within the car. So what I've set up is a demonstration out in the workshop, which I'll show you at the end of the show, uh, which is of a desktop rocket engine. But uh, I suppose what I should do now is to go out there and set that up. Uh, th thank you very much, John. And uh, we'll, we'll just let you go and do that. And if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to put to John about the rocket car or rockets in general, uh, if you just leave those on the YouTube channel or the Google Plus post uh, that you're actually watching via, and we'll try and get all those together and ask John some questions later on. Uh, but now we're going to go over to Deborah, who is um, in a slight change from our advertised program, is going to be talking space. Uh, what, what paper has uh, piqued your fancy this time, Deborah? Okay, well, I actually decided what to talk about today, not based on a paper, but based on a White House press release. So I don't know if any of you guys heard that in January there was 34,435 people sent a petition to the American government asking for them to build a Death Star. So if you haven't seen Star Wars, I recommend you download it immediately so you know what I'm talking about. And since this was more than the requisite 25,000, the White House had to answer this petition. So they definitely added some tongue-in-cheek comments, but they did estimate that it would cost 852 quadrillion U.S. dollars to build the Death Star, and it would take over 800,000 years to build. So in case you're not familiar with the Death Star, this would be a starship roughly the size of the moon that's capable of blowing up planets with a single blast. It has inherent problems such as the trash compactor, but I'll let you see the film so that you understand that one. But this was actually just one in many of space-related issues or phenomenon that have come up so far in 2013. The next one arose with actually mini moons. So a moon, while well, on Earth we're familiar with just the one moon that we can see every night, a moon is actually any object that is orbiting a planet. So we're, of course, concerned with the objects that are orbiting the Earth. Now, asteroids normally come from the asteroid belt, and I'll just share a picture with you so you know what I'm talking about. Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Should be able to see that now. And you can see that we have the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And normally, you, the asteroids are hanging out there. And scientists that are studying anything outside of Earth, anything else in the solar system, are really interested in asteroids. Because these wouldn't have been part of the formation of the Earth. They would be other planetary objects that came here when our solar system was created four and a half billion years ago. So this is really, any, getting any part of an asteroid is what they would consider the Rosetta Stone of astrophysics. But the thing with asteroids is they'd be incredibly difficult to get to because they're so, so far away. But the thing is, sometimes asteroids will fall from this asteroid belt into an orbit surrounding Earth. And these are termed mini-moons because a moon is an object that is orbiting a planet, whereas an asteroid is orbiting the sun. So we want these asteroids to fall from orbiting the sun to mini-moons that are orbiting the planets. Now, Scientists have always wanted to get a hold of these mini-moons, but they haven't previously had the ability to do so. But recently, the U.S. intelligence agency, or the Pentagon, had put aside money and hardware to build two massive observatory, observatories that were going to be used for intelligence. But now that it's been a while since the Cold War, they've decided that they can give this technology to research. So there's currently bids going on to try to get this equipment so that they can make observatories that look about a million and a half kilometers away from the Earth.
to where these mini moons would be created. Now, if we can't get a mini moon, do we have to necessarily go to the asteroid belt? And the answer is no, as was evident from the meteor crash into Russia last week. So I've said a lot of terms that people confuse, so I'm going to go over them quickly. A moon is an object that is orbiting a planet. An asteroid is an object that is orbiting the sun. And a meteor is an asteroid or a moon that makes contact with the planet's surface. So asteroids are a good and a bad thing. They're good in that it's a very easy way for us to get plan planetary rock, or sorry, out of planetary rock, but of course they're incredibly dangerous. There was over a thousand people injured in the one that hit Russia. But actually, we got off incredibly lucky. Because as of yesterday, scientists have taken all the videos they had from camera phones and car videos and SST, or CCTV, and they actually figured out that the original, the full asteroid, the, sorry, the full asteroid that this meteor broke off of actually would have weighed between 7,000 and 10,000 tons and been 15 meters across which of course if it hit the earth would have been absolutely devastating. Now I just showed you this image that said that showed the asteroid belt was between Mars and Jupiter. So how is a rock getting from Mars between Mars and Jupiter to Earth, which is very far away? Well the thing is, not all asteroids are kept within the asteroid belt, even if they are in fact asteroids, meaning that they're orbiting the sun and not orbiting the moon. If I go back to this image that I showed you earlier, you should be able to see now, you can see that the Apollo's belt is very, very different trajectory than the asteroid belt, and it comes much, much closer to Earth. So, scientists think that this asteroid, that came, sorry, the meteor that came off an asteroid was in the Apollo's belt, and this is how it hit Russia and caused such a big problem. There is now, of course, a lot of thought of if we should put more technology in, sorry, more money into technology to try to shoot down any potential meteor, any potential asteroids that have the potential for turning into meteors that could be disastrous. If you've ever seen Armageddon, clearly this is a very serious problem. I believe that Superman is capable of handling it. The Death Star probably would be as well. But as humans, right now, we're at a loss. So there are several potential plans for how we could get rid of these if they come up. Now, many people think that we would want to blow up the asteroids. But that's actually a terrible idea, because then we would just get hundreds of meteors falling towards or Earth. So what we'd actually want to do is create a small explosion between the Earth and the asteroid to just push the asteroid farther away. But in order to do this, we would need, first of all, an incredible detection ability, and second of all, a way of actually setting off a controlled explosion in space. And keep in mind that space is actually getting quite cluttered with all the satellites that we're putting up there, plus there's other planets, other asteroids, other moons. So really, you might want to start getting a little concerned, but since the last giant meteor attack was back in the time of the dinosaurs, I'd say we're probably safe for a while. But I hope I filled you in on what's happening in space for the last couple months, and please ask me any questions if you have them. Yeah, so our biggest problem is going to be actually noticing that these as these asteroids are heading towards us. Um, how far out can we? How 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 big they need to be for us to actually spot them reliably at the moment? You know, the problem actually isn't how big they are; it's how early we can detect them. Because since we can't blow up the asteroid itself, we'd want to set off an explosion between the Earth and the asteroid. We need to be we need it to be a substantial distance away from the Earth for this explosion to be large enough to dislodge the asteroid, but not large enough to affect us. So the current predictions are we need to notice this asteroid coming towards us at least a year in advance. So we do need quite good te detection technology. Yeah, I mean, it must be quite awkward looking for an asteroid rather than something that's emitting light as well, because we look and see stars a long way away, admittedly they're a lot bigger, but the distances are ridiculous, whereas asteroids are actually relatively close to us compared mm -hmm. to most of the stuff that we're looking at with our uh, telescopes. So is it, is it just the fact that they're, they're so dim, relatively speaking, because they're just reflecting light. That's the problem. Yeah, well, I mean, they're only reflecting light, and of course, they're basically black, so there's not that much light to reflect as well. So they're certainly very difficult to see, much harder to see than stars, which are infinitely farther away. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. Uh,
And John, are, are you are you ready and prepared to tell us a bit more about uh, Rocket Engines? I am indeed. Um, I'm now outside in the workshop where the car is when it's not uh, packed away. You can probably see the toolboxes in the background there. <laughs> um, I'm not going to worry about moving the uh, camera because I've got it set up, pointed at the uh, the desktop rocket engine. If you have a look, coming in along this pipe here, we've got GOX, gaseous oxygen, and inside this section here, we've got our fuel grain. Now, the really cool thing about this particular rocket engine is the fuel grain is see-through. It's perspex. We're, we're actually just burning the perspex from the inside to the outside. And, of course, for your, uh, for your um, combustion triangle, you need a fuel, an oxidizer, and, of course, something to get it going. This stuff is absolutely fantastic. If you've ever seen a sort of a Roadrunner Wiley Coyote cartoon, you'll know exactly what this is. It's a fuse wire. You basically light one end and it sort of goes pssss, And we use that just to get it uh, going on the inside. I will say it's very cold out here at the moment. So there is a possibility it might not work first time, uh, in which case it'll take me about 30 seconds to get it going again. Would you like to see it in action? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> So, what I'm doing is I'm feeding through a small amount of oxygen, just a tiny, tiny amount. And it actually shows how, how safe this kind of rocket engine is, that I can actually start to operate it and have my hand in front of it. You know, you, you would not want to do this with a, either, either a uh, solid-fueled motor or, or a liquid-fueled motor. So I've got a tiny stream of gas coming out of the other end there. And I will now use my high-tech lighting device to light the end. I normally have Swan Vesta matches, but uh, this will have to do. That is really cool. <laughs> oh, thank you very much and for that. That's a rocket motor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, how, how much fuel was in there for uh, that one? That was probably only burning for a uh, burn of that length, approximately. Uh, a millimeter, possibly two millimeters, from the inside of the tube. Uh, the rocket, this rocket motor has been specifically designed uh, not to produce thrust. Obviously, it's built into a large, heavy box. Uh, the nozzle at the front. Uh, if I have a look now, you can actually see it uh, better. The nozzle at the front is not entirely what we call a Mac optimized nozzle. That means that it, not all of the energy that's being produced is going to be transmitted directly into a into propulsive motion. Uh, this is this is literally because I use this in schools and I don't want it to go flying and hitting a teacher. Um, we use gaseous oxygen as opposed to anything else because it's. Uh, it's, it's a relatively rubbish oxidizer. Uh, for, for the actual car outside, we use nitrous oxide, which is far, far better. But again, this is, the, you know, I have before now set this off on a teacher's desk in a classroom with a group of uh, sort of 30 or 40 10 year olds crowded around watching it. And for that kind of level of safety, then uh, uh, gaseous oxygen is definitely better. Yeah, it's, it's all about the safety. I mean, there was lots of, um, you, you could tell, um, not just with this, but with your actual car, um, there was an awful lot of um, safety bits built into it, um, like a dead man switch. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we have a 100% success rate with regards to people living on this project, and we'd like to keep it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm going to be the person that's in the car uh, for, the, for, for later tests, and I'm helping to develop some new safety equipment that's going to be going. The car's been past 200 a few times, uh, not for actually a year and a half now, because we've massively 
re-engineered it. We took out the accumulators, those are the big tanks with the nitrous oxide in, and we've replaced them with new ones with better seals, uh, and a lot of the, the systems have been stripped out and upgraded to a, to a much higher standard now that we know that the basic chassis and the basic car and the, is working to try to then double that speed from sort of the little over 200 that we've been doing. Our next intermediate goal is 300, which hopefully we should be able to hit later this year. And as for the 400, uh, we have a policy of not giving a date on that because we don't want to be working to a date. If, if you start working to a date, that's when you start rushing and things start going wrong. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, John. Uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, hopefully getting the chance to see the, the real car driving on a real tarmac road. Well, if you're interested, um, we're going to be doing the test firing this Friday. It's not going to be, we're not doing what Bloodhound did. We're not quite that brave. We're not doing a live uh, firing, although we might do that in the future. And if I do, um, I will be calling you and hopefully we can get that on SciCan. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, John. Deborah, have you got any any questions for John? As the resident chemist, I need to ask what chemical reaction is producing all that power. Ha ha! It's a pyrolysis. So what we're doing with the with well with the with the main rocket engines that we're using in the car. In fact, there are a few of the tubes out of with, with no end caps over here. So I can I can actually, if, if I'm careful, bring you over and you can have a look. So it's a simple aluminium tube. This is one that has a transducer sensor mount that we, uh, we've been using for some pressure set testing. And inside, it literally is just a cardboard tube. And we soak the inside of this with diesel. We've tried lots of different fuels, such as diesel and kerosene, even biodiesel, uh, to try to see what works better. And what happens is this external structure here, the cardboard, acts a bit like a wick. It doesn't really burn away itself, but what happens is the gas comes out from the, from the cardboard and starts to burn with the nitrous oxide, which is the oxidizer, that's blowing down the middle of the tube. And that together then produces a tremendous pressure inside of this tube, which is then exited through the rocket nozzle, which is a properly designed rocket nozzle, and so that does produce thrust. Um, my fantastic fact to do with rocket nozzles, and I really do like this, uh, we might actually have one over here that you can see. Uh, uh, no, they've all... Of course we don't. They're all on the car at the moment, aren't they? Because we're about to do a, a test firing. But the chap that invented the rocket nozzle uh, only really invented two things of note in his life. His name was Gustave de Laval, and he invented the rocket nozzle, and he also invented the automatic milking machine that they use in dairies to milk cows. Yeah, quite, quite distinct achievements there, then. Very, very, very odd, I would say. So, is there anything else I can uh, I can show you that you might be interested in? Uh, no. Or do we have any questions? Uh, I'd like you to just just very quickly for uh, people who might not have been um, might not have done physics uh, since um, school, uh, if you could just quick, quickly go over just how the thrust is actually made, um, because obviously you're not powering the wheels or anything there. Okay, it's actually really really simple. I'll come back into shop for this. Okay, it's really really simple. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. For example, if I was on a skateboard and I was going along on my skateboard and I hit somebody else, that other thing would then start moving off. It's exactly the same with the rocket car. Basically, what we're doing is, is that rocket car is producing gas that shoots out of the back. Because that gas is shooting off in one direction, the car then shoots off in the other direction. You've, I, 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 every single person that's watching this at home has done something the same because I know that everyone has used a balloon before now and it's exactly the same piece of science as uh, you know when you when you have a balloon and you let the balloon go off and, and off don't it goes. believe a word he says <laughs> that's my boss <laughs> no it's actually magic pixies that uh, that, that, that work um, so yeah it's, it's if you, especially if you've ever seen uh, Tesco sell them rocket balloons because they're, they're sort of a, a cylinder of gas 
with a hole at one end and the gas pushes out. The rocket nozzle itself is a special shape that basically means that all the gas is going in a straight direction because of course if you want all of your power to sort of all of your thrust to be in that direction any gas that's sort of doing this thing and going sideways isn't going to help you so it makes sure that all your gases are going in the same direction so your car or your rocket or whatever you've got goes in the other direction. Absolutely no power goes through the wheels, yes. And of course you want to be very careful with your rocket nozzle that it is pointing exactly backwards because you want, you, you want your rocket to be going forwards and not trying to turn itself while you're in it. <laughs> they are actually ever so slightly canted um, and they're ever so slightly canted to uh, sort, of, sort of that way to, so, so that the car has a, has a moment arm that means that it's going to be pushing the front end down onto on, onto the ground, if that makes sense. But uh, yes, I think it was a, there's a famous XKCD uh, webcomic with a picture of a Saturn V rocket on it and um, a note with the rocket engines at the bottom saying, these should be pointed towards the ground. If they are not pointed towards the ground, you will not go to space today. So it's, it's very much that similar sort of uh, idea. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, John. That has been uh, really interesting, and it's nice to see both the desktop engine and the car in one go. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and we're, we've just got time now for one little extra bit of uh, science-related uh, um, stuff that's been going around the internet, uh, which is the two-body interactions, a longitudinal study paper, which was actually presented uh, from one business to another as a marriage proposal. It's a single single uh, page paper with an introduction, um, some results, and a conclusion about how happiness, a conclusion linked to a graph, no less, about how happiness would increase over time, and then that, would, that was projected to continue, and asking the subject of the, the other subject of the study uh, if she would uh, be, be willing for it to, to um, take part in an indefinite continuation of the study which is one of the sweetest and geekiest things that I've seen recently. So uh, if, you, if you get a chance, it's, it's all over the internet. If you type in physicist proposal, you'll find the paper. Um, yeah, I've heard lots of people criticizing it, going, oh, there's no method section, the results aren't repeatable and all this. But uh, uh, as cute geeks go, I think it's pretty good. So yeah, next time on SciCam, we shall hopefully be coming from um, partially coming from the new Cambridge Science Centre and we'll be talking about the Cambridge Science Festival which starts here in a couple of weeks time um, but until then uh, we'll be sharing some more interesting stuff uh, follow us on Google Plus and Facebook and, and Twitter now as well and uh, thank you very much for watching and good night and thank you to John and Deborah for being part of it bye bye <laughs>